Hello there and welcome to our nightly news program coming to you live on All24 News Channel. Here from Algiers, next are today's top stories. Turkey is set for a second round of voting for the first time ever after neither Rajab Tayyip Erdogan nor Kemal Kilic Darulu secured an absolute majority in Sunday's presidential election. Also coming up on the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, Palestinians of the diaspora cling to the right of return and massive events in Ramallah take place. The United Nations commemorates the anniversary for the first time and President Mahmoud Abbas holds the United States and Britain responsible for the ongoing ethnic cleansing and international silence. Also ahead in our news, the Algerian Foreign Minister arrives in Saudi Arabia to chair the Joint Political Consultations Committee. Riyadh hails Algeria's efforts in adopting strategies to support joint Arab action. And the armed clashes in Sudan enter their second month. The incessant fighting dismisses hopes of reaching a permanent ceasefire agreement. Hello again and welcome to the details. First in our news, the chairperson of Turkey's high election board confirmed on Monday that the presidential election race is set off to go for a second round, which is slated for May 28th. The runoff is going to be between incumbent President Tayyip Rajabai Erdogan, who had 49.51% vote, and his opposition rival, Kemal Kilic Darulu, who had 44.88% of the votes count. The second round is set as neither of the two candidates could reach the 50% threshold to win outright. It is clear that none of the candidates has gained the eligibility to be elected as stipulated in the fourth article of the law, number 6271, and our committee has decided to hold a second round of elections on Sunday, May 28, 2023, according to the previously announced election calendar. In Turkey still, as Turkey approaches the runoff vote on May 28th, all eyes will be on the electoral process and the efforts taken to ensure a fair and transparent election. The accusations of interference, however, raised by the opposition serve as a reminder of the importance of upholding democratic principles and preserving the trust of the Turkish electorate. More details with Sofian Kenturi. In the first round of Turkey's election held on Monday, President Tayyip Erdogan emerged with a significant lead, positioning himself favorably for a runoff vote on May 28 that could extend his rule into a third decade. I believe that this figure will rise much higher with the final results. We do not know yet whether the presidential election is over in the first round due to the 50% plus one vote limit of our electoral system. If the decision of our nation shows that the elections have been completed, then there is no problem. On the other hand, Kemal Kilic Darulu, the head of the Six-Party Alliance and Erdogan's main challenger, remained undeterred in a vote to overcome the challenge in the upcoming runoff. Kilic Darulu accused Erdogan's party of interfering with the counting and reporting of election results, raising concerns about the integrity of the electoral process. Despite all the smear campaigns and insults, Erdogan did not get the result he expected. Nobody should get excited about a fait accompli. Election data still continues to come in. If our nation decides to have a runoff, with our pleasure, we will definitely win this election in the second round. Everyone will see it. The significance of Turkey's election has not been limited to the country itself. Observers from Europe, Washington, Moscow and the wider region have closely monitored the proceedings. European Union leaders Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel seized the opportunity to congratulate Turkish voters for their large turnout in the first round of national elections, considering it a triumph for democracy. It's a very clear sign that the Turkish people are committed to exercising their democratic rights to go and vote and that they value the democratic institutions. However, amidst the celebration, some voices in Turkey expressed dissatisfaction and sadness over the election results. These individuals whose sentiments stand in contrast to the prevailing jubilance hope for change. 
Ogan, the third candidate, received 5.17%, enough to swing the runoff vote in favor of either of the candidates. With that, he found himself as the kingmaker in the most important elections in modern Turkey's history. The 55-year-old has been keen to avoid throwing his weight behind either candidate. But he stated he would consult with his party's vote base for their decision in the runoff and made clear that the fight against terrorism and sending refugees back are red lines. If we decide to be with an alliance, a protocol will be signed with them and put in words that no concessions will be made regarding the People's Democratic Party. We have certain red lines to support any candidate, such as fighting against terrorism and sending refugees back. We have voiced these conditions before. I think the elections had to run up because the opposition is not giving enough confidence to the voters. The opposition cannot reassure people that they can solve Turkey's problems. I'd say the opposition is the one that was most affected by the earthquakes. Uh, Turkey President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's AK party has won a majority in the country's parliament, according to the state-run Anadolu Agency. The Turkish news agency published preliminary results that showed AK party winning 266 seats, while the main opposition leader Kemal Kilic Durulu's Republican People's Party winning 166 seat in parliament. The report is signed by Islam Said. Turkey's elections are moving to a second round. This is what latest preliminary results have shown, as the two candidates failed to reach a 50 plus 1 percent. However, the parliamentary votes have shown otherwise, as Erdogan's People's Alliance set to win the majority in Turkey's new parliament with 322 seats out of 600, winning 50 percent of the vote at the expense of the main opposition, the Nation Alliance, who got 213 out of 600 seats. These results will likely serve as a boost for Erdogan's chances in the next presidential runoff and keep the country under his ruling era, a scenario likely to be embodied at the end of May. Currently, the majority in the parliament is in our people's alliance. Our alliance dominates almost all commissions. Therefore, we don't doubt that the choice of our nation, which gave the majority in the parliament to our alliance, would be in favor of trust and stability in the presidential election. Erdogan's AK party has dominated the Turkish parliament for over 20 years. It lost its absolute majority in 2018 elections. It was a year that enabled Erdogan to overturn the parliamentary system into presidential. The move in which Erdogan's main rival, Kemal Kilic Darulo, promised to change it through overturning the country's system to what it was. It is a political dilemma for both clashing parties who fight for dominance and gain an alliance in parliament, as well as winning the presidential race. Actually, some believe that chances might double for Kilic Darulo if he reaches an agreement with the excluded presidential candidate, Sinan Ugan. According to this scenario, Erdogan will have no choice but to widen his alliance circle inside the parliament, which would be impossible as the opposition party came second in majority. The 28th May runoff will determine Turkey's future. That does not rule out surprises and remains uncertain over who will likely be Turkey's leader. Palestinians buried a man on Monday who was shot and killed by Zionist forces during a raid in the city of Nablus. Islamic Jihad resistance group claimed the dead man a member, identifying him as 22-year-old Salah Sabra. Soon after the young man's death, Palestinians hurled rocks and explosives at the occupation forces. Nablus has been a flashpoint city and site of regular raids and clashes during the last year. 75 years have passed after the Nakba, which displaced over 75,000 Palestinians from their own homes. Palestinians still live in hope of returning to their original places, as they have not forgotten their properties and lands, which were forcibly taken by the Zionist occupation. Usama Ayadi has more. We will return. It is a sentence which was written by the Palestinians on these stones. It was after they lost everything, the lands, homes, and all what represents their freedom. But their hearts and minds are still determined to return to their ancestral properties. My early childhood is here. The love of a mother and father, home, 
my sister, my brother, our neighbors. We used to go to the spring to play inside the water. Each one of us is like a fish. Every year on the 15th of May, Palestinians around the world commemorate one of the most bitter days of the Palestinian history, the Nakba Day, or the catastrophe in its literal translation. It is the day when more than 75,000 Palestinians were expelled from their own lands and homes. In only one hour, we took refuge under the trees. We were kings, and then we became refugees. Our houses were full of food and clothes. We left as we were. On the second day, there were organizations or agencies. We went to houses of rich people and to the municipality to ask for food. After a week, we started to request clothes. 78% of the historic Palestinian lands were occupied by the Zionist forces, while the remaining 22% were divided to what are known now, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 75 years later, way over 6 million Palestinians still live with the hope of returning to their original lands and homes, which were forcibly taken by the occupiers. Many Palestinians were forced to seek what they thought would be a temporary shelter. However, they found themselves unable to return to their own homes. This is the house of my grandparents. Here is where my eyes saw the life for the first time. Here I breathed for the first time. I will never forget and I will certainly return. This year, the United Nations is commemorating the Nakba for the first time in the West Bank, where Palestinians exercise limited self-governance and wide on safety under the Zionist military rule. A siren sounds for 75 seconds to mark 75 years since the Nakba. Zionist occupation has rejected any such right of return as a demographic threat to its Jewish minority. Still, even young Palestinians who have never seen their ancestral homes live in hope and determination to return to the place where their ancestors belonged one day. Still with Palestine, President Mahmoud Abbas stated that major countries, including the United States and Britain, are not reacting against the continuous Zionist aggression and refuse to hold the Zionist entity accountable. Abbas added in a speech during the event commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, which was organized for the first time at the United Nations headquarters in New York, and the line that the most Western countries have accepted that the occupation remains above the law, providing them with protection from any accountability or punishment. <laughs> The major countries that you all know are standing today with no reaction against the continuous violence against our people and refuse to hold Israel accountable for its violence and occupation of the Palestinian lands and the building of camps on its lands and destroying the two-state solution and violating the historic and legal agreement in the holy site of Al-Aqsa. These countries have accepted that the occupying force remains above the law and they are providing protection from any accountability or punishment. Britain and the United States especially take the political and ethical responsibility for the Nakba of the Palestinian people because both of them participated in making our people the victim. To a different story now, Algerian Foreign Minister Mr. Ahmad Ataf arrived on Monday in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia on an official visit as part of strengthening brotherly relations and cooperation between the two countries and also to take part in the preparatory ministerial meetings for the Arab summit to be held on May 19th, according to a statement by the Algerian Foreign Ministry. The same source added that Minister Ataf and his Saudi counterpart, Prince Faisal bin Farhan bin Abdullah Al Saud, will chair on Tuesday the proceedings of the fourth session of the Algerian Saudi Political Consultation Committee in order to intensify the pace of consultation and coordination between the two countries on all issues of common concern. On Monday, Algeria handed over the presidency of the Economic and Social Council of Arab League to Saudi Arabia during a preparatory meeting preceding the 32nd Arab Summit in Jeddah. Saudi Minister of Finance Mohammed Al Jadan praised Algeria's efforts in adopting a set of strategies aimed at supporting the process of joint Arab action. Zarafar Jenny has more. <laughs> 
Algeria handed over the chairmanship of the Economic and Social Council of the Arab League to Saudi Arabia on Monday, a few months after the 31st Algiers Arab Summit that achieved the goal of unifying Arab ranks and joint cooperation, especially at the economic and social levels. I extend my sincere appreciations to the People's Democratic Republic of Algeria for the great efforts it exerted during its presidency of the proceedings of the previous Arab League session, which resulted in a wide range of decisions that stress the importance of joint Arab action. The Algiers Arab Summit was a pivotal milestone in the path of the Arab League, for it sought consensus on long-standing issues that have divided member states and also reached important decisions, most important of which supporting the process of joint action. I take this opportunity to welcome the return of Syria to the League of Arab States, looking forward to working with everyone to achieve what our leaders and peoples aspire to. I thank the Democratic Republic of Algeria, which developed a number of initiatives to meet the challenges last November, as it took a number of important decisions in the economic and social fields. The proceedings of the Economic and Social Council meeting at the ministerial level come as part of the preparatory meetings for the Arab Summit, scheduled to be held on the 19th of this month in the Saudi capital Jeddah. This session is expected to continue promoting joint Arab action in order to face challenges affecting the Arab world. A Syrian delegation headed by Minister of Economy Mohammed Samir al-Khalil participated on Monday for the first time in 12 years in a preparatory meeting that precedes the Arab summit scheduled to be held next Friday in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Footage broadcast by the official Saudi news channel from inside the meeting of the Economic and Social Council preparatory to the summit in Jeddah showed that the Syrian diplomatic delegation occupied Syria's seat for the first time in a meeting of the Arab League since November 2011. I take this opportunity to welcome the return of Syria to the League of Arab States, looking forward to working with everyone to achieve what our leaders and peoples aspire to. To some other news, Algerian Prime Minister Ayman bin Abdurrahman received on Monday Portuguese Minister of Economy and Maritime Antonio Costa Silva, who is on a working visit to Algeria. Algerian Prime Minister or Algerian Prime Ministry revealed that the meeting was an opportunity to review the reality and prospects of bilateral relations and ways to enhance cooperation between the two countries, especially in light of the results of the sixth session of the Algerian-Portuguese Joint Economic Working Group, which took place in Algeria on the 14th and 15th of May. The two sides also touched on important bilateral challenges and their line in their firm will to develop bilateral cooperation in various fields. The visit of an important delegation from the National Institute for Political and Strategic Studies of Nigeria to Algeria revealed solid and strategic qualifications that support steps to accelerate the completion of the Trans-Saharan Gas Pipeline. The visit has also revealed the possibility of expanding the sectoral partnership between the two parties towards the field of energy transition. Algeria, which has the longest pipeline network for transporting gas in the African continent, is taking steady steps to define the Trans-Saharan Gas Pipeline project, which is the most logical crossing for the largest facility in the continent, starting from gas sources in Nigeria and reaching Algeria via Niger. Greater ties and cooperation between Nigeria and Algeria. And uh, we have learned a lot, and we know that by coming here, we have lessons to take back home to Nigeria because uh, Algeria is doing very well as far as the team of this study is concerned, which is industrialization, energy security, and climate change. Well, to some extent, we expect that. Algeria should be able to come to Nigeria and invest in areas to do with industrialization, energy security, and climate change. Because Algeria has gone very far. Still with Algeria-related news, a cooperation agreement was signed between Algeria and Mauritania in the area of trade cooperation, pilot training, and aircraft maintenance. 
The President General, manager of Air Algérie or Algerian Airlines, stated Algeria's intention to strengthen the technical aspect of its air fleet, similar to the maintenance pool based on the experience of Mauritania, provided memorandums of understanding are reached in the near future between the two countries within the framework of reconstruction the company. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke on Monday with Moroccan Foreign Minister to review regional and global developments. Secretary Blinken affirmed full U.S. support for U.N. personal envoy of the Secretary General Stéphane de Mistura as he intensifies the U.N. process on Western Sahara toward an enduring and dignified political solution for the people of Western Sahara and the region. This is a clear sign that the U.S. frees itself from former President Donald Trump's unilateral decision to recognize Moroccan sovereignty over the contested territory of Western Sahara through a simple tweet. In a statement to the Sahrawi News Agency on the occasion of the commemoration of the Sahrawi people of the 50th anniversary of the outbreak of the armed struggle, Sahrawi Foreign Minister Sadati stressed that the Sahrawi people commemorate their major and important stations of struggle in the light of the unprecedented international and regional changes and the return of the Sahrawi question to the international agenda, which occurs in a context of growing international sympathy and condemnation of the crimes of the Moroccan occupation and defamation of its injustice. The former Spanish deputy head of government, Pablo Iglesias, said it was a mistake supporting the Moroccan dictatorship and betray the dignity of the Sahrawi people. And in a popular gathering, Iglesias also indicated that the presence of his political formation within the Spanish government does not mean silence over what he described as a great mistake, stressing that Pedro Sanchez committed numerous scandals that contradicted United Nations resolutions banning the Sahrawi people from their right to self-determination. Previously in Spanish newspaper Publico, the former Spanish deputy prime minister had criticized the decision of Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, noting that this was the result of the Moroccan blackmail. Brazilian progressive parties expressed their support for the Polisario Front on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of its founding. For their part, the three Brazilian political organizations, the Communist Party of Brazil, the Party of Socialism and Freedom, and the Workers' Party, led by President-elect Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, renewed their commitment to the Frente Polisario and their solidarity with the struggle of the Sahrawi people for their right to self-determination. One month ago, chaos erupted in Khartoum and left tens of thousands of families enduring shortages of food and basic supplies, while others are trapped indoors as a result of the persistent deadly conflict between the Sudanese army and its paramilitary rivals. More with Selman Asib in this report. The city of five million on the Nile River was long a place of relative stability and wealth. However, since the unrest erupted, Sudan has seen countless negotiations and multiple trust deals that have been agreed upon yet quickly violated by the country's two biggest armed groups, the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Paramilitary Support Forces, even a month later. No solution is in sight. On Monday, Sudan woke up to heavy clashes between the two rivals that have long competed for relevance and power. Meanwhile, many civilians reported having seen armored vehicles from both forces roaming the streets and heard heavy gunfire in multiple urban quarters. As a result of this conflict, many families were left homeless, sleeping inside tents they've built from blankets, resorting to public shaded areas as an escape from the intense sunlight and now the way we are here with the children and the mothers some of them they are sick and some of them, there's no food people they can eat so we are suffering we came under the united nations but they cannot do anything to us we came to the government of sudan who are leading this town over here they cannot help us in anymore we are listening that they are taking some other people from outside they are realizing that if you are not like that they're going to take you to the war zone 
What are we going to do in the war zone and we run from the war? Among homeless families that lost their homes, Reem, a Sudanese mother who is fearing for her child's safety, asked for help from humanitarian bodies before health conditions here get worse. We have children and we're unable to do anything. We came from war and we're staying here in this heat. This is not healthy for these children. We're unable to do anything and none of the entities are helping. Please help us, humanitarian organization. Please help us, not for us, but for the sake of these children. We have pregnant and sick elderly women. We have people whose health could get worse. So far, the unrest has killed at least 676 people and injured 5,576, though with many reports of people missing and bodies left unburied. The real toll is expected to be much higher. In addition, about 200,000 have fled into neighboring countries and more than 700,000 have been displaced inside Sudan, triggering a humanitarian crisis that threatens to destabilize the whole region. Well, that's the end of our program. For more, visit our social media platforms. Thank you for watching. Till next time, cheers.